I know, high intensity cardio is not what anyone really wants to talk about. It sucks to do in the moment. But before you click off of this video, know that recent research shows that it helps you to actually rewire your brain after a stroke. So if you hate it, you don't have to do it. No one's gonna force you. But if you're willing to do anything to get the best possible outcomes as fast as possible, don't skip this one. Hi, I'm Elise. I hold a clinical doctorate in occupational therapy, and I'm also a certified stroke rehabilitation specialist. Today, we'll cover what high intensity interval training is, the science behind how it rewires your brain after a stroke, if it's safe to do for stroke survivors, and modifications that you can make to meet you wherever you're at in your recovery. All right, let's get into it. What is HIT and why is it effective? Now, if you don't care to learn about the science and evidence behind HIT, go ahead and skip to this timestamp to learn about its safety and how to do it. But if you're a nerd like me, let's dig into the science. High intensity interval training or HIT is a form of cardiovascular exercise where you have these short bursts of a maximum intensity effort followed by longer recovery periods. You repeat that sequence a number of times or for a specific length of time. And we know that in response to doing general cardiovascular exercise, we have more well-controlled blood pressure, increased insulin sensitivity, and increased VO2 max, which is how efficiently your body can use oxygen. In addition to all of these great things, HIT in particular has a very exciting effect on the body. It increases the level of a protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, I'll call BDNF. And this is important for several different reasons. It actually helps to encourage neuron survival and growth, as well as encourages synaptic plasticity or the ability of neurons to connect to each other. And this is important for several stroke-specific reasons. BDNF encourages positive neuroplasticity, and it also helps to protect the brain. So we wanna do what we can to keep BDNF levels high. Now, what we understand is that the brain actually makes 70 to 80% of the BDNF in our body, whether we are resting or exercising. But here's the really cool part. When you're doing HIT, your brain actually releases two to threefold more of BDNF. And inversely, we found that BDNF levels decrease when you're doing more moderate intensity exercise. That might be more endurance activities like walking, a light jog over a consistent period of time where you're still able to talk and sing during those activities. So ultimately, what does this mean? Well, it doesn't mean that moderate intensity exercises are bad for you. Anything that you can do to get more physically active is really important. But it does mean that moderate intensity exercise is not adequate to stimulate brain healing and motor learning after a stroke, which is what we're trying to do to help promote progress and recovery. Based on research, HIT is the optimal intensity to help increase BDNF levels as well as to increase our VO2 max. And this means that our brains can use oxygen more efficiently. It can lead to better blood flow, the brain healing better and more efficiently, and it can also stimulate neuronal growth and connections. All the things that we're looking to do to promote brain healing and progress after a stroke. Is HIT safe after a stroke? So just like with anything that I talk to you about, you always need to reach out to your doctor to determine if new exercise or therapy routine is gonna be right for you. Your doctor may wanna run some tests before giving you the okay. However, based on research, for most stroke survivors in the chronic stage, meaning you're six plus months out from your stroke, and as long as you check with your doctor, HIT can be a safe, an effective way to boost your overall health, as well as to enhance your progress in your stroke recovery. However, there are some people who should definitely not do HIT, and those are people with uncontrolled high blood pressure, people who have orthostatic blood pressure, meaning that they have random drops in the blood pressure, especially when there's a change in position. It might make you feel lightheaded, dizzy, or you might even black out. Or if you have a resting heart rate above 120 beats per minute. And there's also some precautions people need to take 
if they're doing HIIT and they start to feel any type of chest pain, severe shortness of breath, you become lightheaded or nauseous, you need to stop immediately and call your doctor. How do you do HIIT? So as far as frequency, there's a wide range in the literature between two to five days a week. For me, five is way too much. I personally do two days a week of HIIT training, but your mileage may vary. As far as intensity, you're gonna aim for 60 to 80% of your heart rate reserve or 85 to 95% of your max heart rate. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. As far as time, you wanna aim for a 20 to 30 minute session. And just remember, that's always something that you can work up to. And type. This is any cardiovascular exercise that gets your heart pumping. So let's talk about what this might functionally look like if you're trying to do a HIIT workout. You might start off with around a three minute warm up, literally to get your body warmed up and prepared. You'd then go into a 30 second maximum intensity effort. That would then be followed by around a one to three minute recovery period, depending on how you're feeling. And then you would repeat that sequence until your time is up. You just wanna make sure you get, give yourself around like a two to three minute cool down at the end. Now let's backtrack just a little bit and talk about training intensity. Where do you want your heart rate to be when you're giving those maximum effort intervals? So like I mentioned, there are two ways that are really good for doing this, and that's to calculate a percentage of your heart rate reserve or a percentage of your max heart rate. The calculation is a little bit more complex and complicated, but I will leave a link down in the description to a calculator that you can use to find that percentage for yourself. Now of note, if you are on beta blockers, you wanna subtract 15 beats per minute from your maximum heart rate. That brings us to the point that you need to be monitoring your heart rate in some way while you are doing high intensity interval training. Now, if you have a smart watch, this is something that you should be able to find out pretty easily. You can also use something like a chest strap or even a cheap pulse oximeter that you can just keep on your finger while you're exercising. But this allows you to understand if you are hitting your target heart range and to also help you ensure that you're not overdoing it. All right, so we understand the intensity in terms of heart rate that we're looking to achieve during a high intensity interval training session, but how do we actually achieve getting that high intensity? Well, there are usually two ways to do this. You can either increase the speed of whatever you're doing, or you can increase the force or resistance. So let's take the treadmill for example. If you are getting ready to do one of your maximum effort intervals and you wanna bump up your intensity, you can increase that speed, that's gonna get your heart rate going faster, or you can increase the incline. That's going to give you more force to fight against. It's gonna feel like you're going up a hill and it's also going to increase your heart rate as well. What are the modifications for HIT? Using a treadmill has been the most widely studied in the research. It is a really easy way to be able to change your intensities by either changing speed or incline. But here's the thing, not everybody has access to a treadmill and for many stroke survivors, it's going to be impossible to use one because maybe you're not back to walking yet or you can't safely and steadily walk on a treadmill. If that's the case, no worries, we have other options for you too. You can also do HIIT training on something like a recumbent bike or even like a new step, which you may have seen in a physical therapy clinic. So if you still have access to formal therapy, this is something that you can actually talk to your therapist about doing. One of the most accessible and cheap ways that you can do this is to buy a personal ergometer. This is like one of those little cycling things that you can either do with your hands or with your feet. They're relatively inexpensive compared to a lot of other equipment or compared to a gym membership. And I'll leave some links down in the description in case you're interested in grabbing one. But if you don't have access to equipment or you don't have the money to buy an ergometer to have at home, you can do this simply, for example, by doing seated punches. You can warm up with some gentle movement, right? Get that body warmed up, heart rate moving. When you go into your maximum effort, um, interval, you can pick up the speed 
Or you can potentially grab a, a dumbbell, you can grab you know, a bag of rice, whatever you can do to increase that force for that 30 seconds or that speed for 30 seconds before you go into your recovery period. You do wanna make sure that you're still monitoring your heart rate to ensure that you're reaching those target ranges and to make sure that it's not going over where it needs to go. Now here's something really interesting to keep in mind if you're not walking yet or you're not able to do treadmill training versions of HIT. There was actually a 2018 study that looked at stroke survivors who did only arm HIT training using an upper extremity bicycle three times a week over the course of five weeks. And here's what they found. They demonstrated significant improvement in walking in balance and improved hand and ankle strength. And I know what you're asking, didn't they just work with their arms and hands? And the answer is yes. It's not completely well understood, but we have these things in our spine called central pattern generators. And these help to um, regulate coordinated rhythmic limb movement, like with walking or cycling. Now these are not impacted after a stroke, which means that we can take advantage of them to make more progress. It's thought that by doing this rhythmic arm movement, like hand cycling, that it actually activates networks that contribute to lower extremity rhythmic movement and increases nerve growth to those leg muscles. So even if you can't do treadmill training and you can only use your arms, you can still get amazing whole body benefits by doing HIIT workouts with your arms and hands. I know HIIT isn't for everyone, but leave me a comment and let me know. Is it something you're interested in trying? Or let me know if it's something you've tried before and how it impacted your recovery. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, become a channel member by clicking the join button, or leave us a super thanks by clicking in the YouTube bar below. As always, a huge thank you to all of the donors who make this nonprofit possible. With a special thanks to Heather G, Ryan D, Modus Nova, and Joseph M in our Empower tier on Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.